Good morning. Merry Christmas. Welcome to Emmanuel Assembly of God. This morning we're going to continue our lesson series on the temptation of Jesus. So let's get our notes. Click on the lower left hand corner and the notes will pop up. And then get your Bible, get your cup of coffee, and let's get ready to study God's Word this morning. title of our lesson this morning is reverencing the desert place in Matthew chapter 5. The appearance and source of temptation changes with time. Satan appeared, remember that, Satan appeared as a serpent to Eve. Then Satan appeared to Jesus as an angel. He rarely shows who he really is. And he rarely tells the truth of the outcome of taking the bait. If you were to ask people today, let's go to the drug addict or the drunk or the person bound by terrible addictions. Um, if you were to ask them when they began, they would certainly tell you that this is not anything that they anticipated. You don't have to like the desert, but this morning as we are talking about reverencing the de desert, find its value. How is that a plus in our lives? Question number two, we have already looked at the three temptations from Satan with Jesus. Remember, he tempted Jesus with desires. Turn these stones into bread. Jesus was hungry. He had been fasting and praying for 40 days. So we've looked at the temptation of desire. And then we looked at the temptation of applause. Jump from the pinnacle. Show yourself who you really are. And then we looked at the final temptation now, I don't mean the last one ever, but the, we have three main temptations here. The final one was authority. Bow and worship me. All of these were simply one choice. If you look at them, if you boil it down to its very simplest form, each one of these was a choice. Choose God or choose the devil. There's only two choices. Now, it may not necessarily be the devil in every single choice that we have. It may be me choosing ourselves or someone or something. However, ultimately that leads us away from the Lord. And so that, you know, it's going to take us toward the enemy. Question number three, you do know that Satan wants us to fail. Okay. He knows one failure is not confined to one little small area. That failure spreads to other areas quickly. It's like having a bad piece of fruit in a bag. Okay, it's going to spread. Now, the devil can't make us fail. I know, remember Flip Wilson years ago? The devil made me do it. Well, the devil can't make us do it. Now, these three areas are real temptation to all men, desires, applause, and power. The rest of our lives are impacted by our choice. So it doesn't matter which one of these three, and sometimes a temptation will encompass more than one of these or a variant of each one of these. And so the rest of our lives <coughs> excuse me, are going to be impacted by that choice. Now, question number four. Think about how Eve tempted. Uh, Eve was tempted by Satan. That fruit is pleasant to the eye to look at it. Uh, if that fruit, let's just say that that fruit was an ugly fruit. Okay, uh, we're not tempted by the ugly stuff. The, the if it smelled bad, you know, we're not tempted by that stuff. And it was desirable to gain wisdom. We all want to be smart or smarter than the average bird, right? Okay. Think, Satan is predictable. If he tried it with Eve, 
And if he tried it with Jesus, what about you? Okay? He's going to do that. And we keep making the same mistakes, don't we? We keep falling for the same temptations. Now, when I say we, I know, don't, don't, you know, you say, Pastor, I have never failed that. I have never done that. Right, but mankind, we keep making the same mistakes and we keep falling for the same temptations. John 14, 30 and 31 Prince of this world has no hold on me, Jesus said. Jesus did all God the Father asked of him. See, obedience is the guide of God's will in our life, in our lives. And so as we follow the Lord, the more that we follow him, the less the pull of the world and when we make mistakes and when we yield to temptation, then the devil has a hold on us. Do the right thing. He has no claim on us. Today, Jesus walked away from the temptation unscathed. And he walked into the multitude with humble confidence. Those would keep him on track for the cross or God's plan. So these successes of not yielding to desire, not yielding to applause, and not yielding to Satan's offer of authority, those would help him to keep his focus on where he was going. Now question number six. Please wait and keep your spirit sweet. Okay, God's desert is always a source of growth for us. Now, there's a, there is a precursor here. You know, some people don't learn. And some people don't want to learn. And they don't want to be comforted. And so, it, it may take us going around the desert a couple times before we learn to grow. Um, let's grab firmly onto the anchor of God's Word. We learn self-control as we are faced with temptation. We will see who God really is, the one that is always with us. He never leaves us and he never forsakes us. And he always is there to give us the strength that we need. We come to realize who we are in Christ. We have been grafted into the family of God, brothers and sisters with the Lord, joint heirs with Christ. We learn discipline. We learn how to say yes, yes, yes to the Lord. And we learn how to say no, no, no to temptation. And we gain an eternal perspective that life, our lives are not just for today, but we have a future in the Lord. We have eternity to look forward to. And we are given a submission based authority. The authority of the Lord is given to you by him, not, not by the world, not by people. And when you realize who you are in Christ, man didn't give you that authority and man can't take that authority away from you. Now, question number seven, these benefits are not simply handed to us. The Lord doesn't, you know, we just don't, after we become a Christian, he just hands us all of these benefits and that we're suddenly mature. They are grown, as in fruit, in the desert. We need that desert place for us to grow in Christ. Wait, because Jesus is worthy of our worship. We may not see the benefit today, but wait. Just as the scripture says, wait, I say, wait upon the Lord. And this is where you have some control. Keep the waters of your spirit sweet. Don't become bitter. Don't allow the things that, you know, the mistakes and stuff that happen, the silence, the wilderness, the desert, don't let those things cause you to become bitter. And don't allow it to stop. See, sometimes it becomes bitter because we stop growing 
or we stop reading God's Word and we stagnate. You know how a pool of water, if, if that water doesn't have any source for it to let the bad stuff out, that, that water will stagnate and, and become terrible. But, you know, just as our lives, we need to let, as things come in, we need to let them go and let the Lord purge us. And so there is where we embrace the stillness. Now, we're going to look at some Bible characters uh, as we conclude uh, this section of our lesson. Think of David. What was David's first job? He was a shepherd out in the fields. And what was he? All alone. So what did he do? What did this boy that, that uh, was out there in the backside of the desert, uh, what, he practiced with his sling, okay? Round and around, he put the stone. You know, can you imagine him uh, watching the sheep all day long and how many, you know, boys love to throw rocks, right? Okay? And uh, sometimes we get down by the water and we'll see these boys and they're just throwing the rocks into the ocean. And, you know, you know, think they're going to fill that pond up. Okay? He practiced and he practiced and he practiced with it. Uh, he wrote a few psalms, right? He wrote a few songs. And uh, he did a lot of waiting in his lifetime. Not just when he was a shepherd, okay? When he was anointed king, when Samuel came and anointed him king, it was years after his anointing before he became king. He even had to wait seven more years after he was anointed king by Judah to become king over all of Israel. And so sometimes our desert, our wilderness, sometimes it's, it's quite a while. Now, let's look at Sarah in the Old Testament. Abraham and Sarah. Sarah waited 25 years for the birth of Isaac. Imagine her chagrin when one day that Abraham told her that she was going to have a son. And she, in her head, yeah, right. Now, those were not easy years. You imagine being year after year, month after month, week after week, day after day, no child, no son. She was well beyond the age of childbearing. That just, you know, it was just was in the natural, was not going to happen. We do know that she created a nightmare by giving Hagar to Abraham for a child. Okay? Now, this, we need to be patient in our wilderness. We need to be patient in our desert. Those silent times when we're not seeing the answer to prayer, let's don't get ahead of God. Remember Sarah, she thought, you know, that's what we do. We think or we overthink. I... Uh, I kind of sometimes tend to overthink a situation or, or the answer on, you know, and here she created this situation and she told Abraham, you go have a child by Hagar and maybe that's what the Lord meant. And now Abraham, he, he should have, uh, he should not have done that. And uh, he should have relied upon what the Lord had said, that Sarah was going to have that child. And, well, he gave in to Sarah, and he had a child, and the child was Ishmael. And uh, we, you know that Ishmael, well, he made fun of Isaac when Isaac was finally born. And uh, there was just so much jealousy that was going on. And for the safety of Isaac, she... She had to send Ishmael and Hagar away. And so uh, when we're not patient, we can create a, bear, a bad situation. And then it, help, then it forces us to make some very difficult decisions years later. Let's look at Joseph, question number 10. Uh, Joseph was a dreamer. Joseph was the firstborn of uh, Rachel, remember? Uh, Jacob, uh, he loved Rachel and he wanted to marry Rachel and he asked Laban, her father, and he said, yes, you can marry. Work for me seven years and, and I'll give her to you as wife. 
Well, you know the story how that he worked for seven years and he was so excited. And when he got married, woke up the next morning, he decided that found that he had been deceived and Laban had switched Rachel for the younger daughter, Leah. And oh, Joseph was, or Jacob was so mad. And then uh, he said, well, work for me another seven years because it's not right that the uh, older daughter has to wait until after the younger, you know, the, the younger daughter can get married before the older daughter. You know, you know, uh, fulfill the, the week, the wedding week for uh, Leah. And then at the end of that, you can uh, marry Rachel and you, you'll work another seven years. And, and he did. And well, in the meantime, Leah had lots of children and Rachel didn't have any children. But finally, the Lord intervened, and Rachel had a child. In fact, she had two children. She had Joseph and Benjamin. Now, Joseph was a dreamer. Uh, now, when I say a dreamer, he wasn't a daydreamer. Uh, he was not a dreamer that he had all these fancy schemes and plans, and he wanted to do all this stuff. But no, God was speaking to him in dreams. Now, it was not a good idea to tell his brothers his dreams. You know, sometimes when the Lord impresses on us or gives us a dream, mom should be the word. Okay? If God's going to do it and be in it, let him do it. Don't, don't kind of put it, you know, he was telling his brothers that, you know, you're one day you're going to bow down to me. Yes, that was true, but he, not a good idea. And you know what they did? They, they took him and they ripped up his, you know, his coat of many colors and they put goat's blood all over it. And uh, they sold him to the Midianites and they took the coat back to his father and says, isn't this, this, isn't this the coat of your son, your son, Joseph? And so he ended up being sold as a slave to the Midianites. The Midianites took him down to Egypt and uh, he was sold to Potiphar. And, you know, he, imagine this wilderness time in his life, this desert time in his life. And then he went to be in from a steward in Potiphar's house to, because you remember the story, how that Potiphar's wife had designs on him and he refused and he ended up being thrown in jail. But one day uh, in jail, you know, been there a long time, uh, he interpreted two dreams and uh, one of the dreams, he said, uh, you're going to die. And to the other one, he says, you're going to live. And when you live, remember me to Pharaoh, because I'm not in here uh, justly. This is not right. And uh, finally, one that man did remember him when Pharaoh had a dream. And Joseph was called and cleaned up. And he came into Pharaoh. And uh, the Lord showed to Joseph the interpretation of the dreams. There was coming a great famine. There were going to be seven years of plenty, followed by seven years of famine. And uh, they were to prepare. And Pharaoh put Joseph in charge of the preparation of getting ready for those seven lean years. So each one of these people, David and Sarah and Joseph, they had deserts. They had wilderness. They had Times of stillness and waiting and waiting, waiting. You may have had times of waiting already. Maybe you've been lucky so far and you haven't had any times of waiting. Well, don't brag. Your time of waiting, your time of wilderness, that's, that's coming. So as we close our lesson uh, this morning on Christmas, let us reverence the desert in your life. No, we don't embrace it like a prickly cactus. No, but we recognize that those times of stillness, those times of desert, those times of wilderness, those times of being alone are a time for you and me to grow. Let's grow in the desert. Amen. Well, Merry Christmas. Thank you for being with us this morning. Let's close in prayer. Lord, we thank you for the gift of the Son, gift of the birth of Jesus Christ and what he has meant for us. 
We thank you, Lord, that he was an example to us as he went through the wilderness, as he went through the desert. Lord, there are times in our lives that we're going to go through lean years and lean days and weeks and months. Lord, help us to be faithful to you. Help us to learn. Help us to grow. And may they be a time of benefit to us and to others. Bless us today on this, the very holy day of the year of the birth when we remember the birth of Jesus Christ. Joy to the world. The Lord has come. Amen. God bless you this morning and have a Merry Christmas and a wonderful, happy new year. God bless.